Okay, so today we're going to talk about the um, guilt offering today. With the understanding of a sin, now we are going to talk about guilt offering. What is guilt offering is about? Um, let's read the Bible first. <coughs> If a person sins because he does not speak up when he hears a public charge to testify regarding something he has seen or learned about, he will be held responsible. Or if a person touches anything ceremonially unclean, whether the carcasses of unclean wild animal or of unclean livestock or of unclean creatures, that moves along the uh, ground even though he is unaware of it he has become unclean and is guilty so let's talk about the very first part of it if a person sins because he does not speak up when he hears a public charge to testify regarding something he has seen or learned about he will be held responsible when I read this particular passage that reminds me of, of me of a certain passage in the Bible, that passage is Ezekiel chapter 3. <coughs> Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 3 is a something where you should probably know. <clears throat> and he said to me, Son of man, eat what is before you. Eat this scroll, then go and speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he gave me the scroll to eat. Then he said to me, Son of man, eat this scroll I am giving you, and fill your stomach with it. So I ate it, and he tasted it as sweet as honey in my mouth. He then said to me, Son of man, go now to the house of Israel and speak my words to them. You are not being sent to, the, uh, to a people of obscure speech and difficult language, but to the house of Israel. Not to many people of obscure speech and difficult language whose words you cannot understand surely if I had sent you to them they would have listened to you but the house of Israel is not willing to listen to you because they are not willing to listen to me for the whole house of Israel is hardened and abstained but I will make you as unyielding and hardened as they are I will make your forehead like the hardest stones, harder than flint. Do not be afraid of them or terrified by them, though they are a rebellious house. And he said to me, Son of man, listen carefully and take to heart all the words I speak to you. Go how to your countrymen in exile and speak to them. Say to them, This is what the sovereign Lord says. Whether they listen or fail to listen, then the Spirit lifted me up, and I heard behind me a loud trembling sound. May the glory of the Lord uh, be praised in his dwelling place. The sound of the wings of the living creatures brushing against each other, and the sound of the wheel besides them, a loud rumbling sound. The Spirit then lifted me up and took me away, and I went in bitterness and in the ang anger of my spirit which the strong hand of the Lord upon me I came to the exile who lived at uh, Tel, Tel, uh, Tel Abib near the Kedar River and there where, the, uh, where they were living I sat among them for 70 days overwhelmed 
So God told Ezekiel, come and eat this scroll. So he actually took the scroll and ate it. When he ate it, it was as sweet as honey when he ate it. But when he got into his stomach, it became very sour. But, but then, go and tell the people about what you heard. Whatever you ate, go and tell them. Whether they listen or don't listen, just tell them. Continue on from verse 16. At the end of a seven days, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give them warning for me, from me. When I say to a wicked man, you will, you will surely die, and you do not warn him or speak out to this uh, this this uh this dissuaded him from his evil way in order to save his life the wicked man will die for his sins and i will hold you accountable for this blood but if you do warn the wicked man and he does not turn his uh, wickedness or from his evil ways he will die for his sins but you will have saved yourself so god is saying i am making you as watchmen the responsibility of the watchman is you stand at the top of the palace and when there's a someone is actually attacking or coming to attack you all you have to do is turn around and tell the people running around prepare for your battle so you, watchman's job is what they see they have to tell the people to warn them. If they ignore that warning, then if the, the, if the person dies because he ignores the warning, it's okay. But if you don't tell them, and if the person dies because you didn't tell them, then I'm going to make you accountable. Now it's your responsibility to, because you didn't tell the people and they died. So there is a difference. The watchman, if they tell the people what they saw then whether the other person listen and run away or ignore and die it's not your responsibility because you did what you're supposed to do you as a watchman do all the due diligence and you did what you're supposed to do so i'm not going to make you accountable for this death but if you don't tell anyone and the person died, it's now your responsibility because you as a watchman did not do your work. This chapter 3 is somewhat interesting. Verse 20, again, when a righteous man turns from his righteousness and does evil, and I put a stumbling block before him, he will die, since you did not warn him, he will die for his sins. The righteous thing he did will not be remembered, and I will hold you accountable for his blood. But if you do warn the righteous man not to sin, and he does not sin, he will surely live because he, will, uh, he took warning, and you will have saved yourself. The hand of the Lord was upon me there, and he said to me, Get up and go out to the plain, and there I will speak to you. So I got up and went out to the plain, and the glory of the Lord was standing there, like the glory I had seen by the standing before, uh, bef uh, uh, standing there, like the glory I had seen by the Kedar, and I fell face down. Then the Spirit came into me and raised me to my feet. He spoke to me and said, Go shut yourself inside your house. And you, son of man, they will tie with ropes. You will be bound so that you can not go out among the people. I will make your tongue stick to the roof of your mouth so that you will be 
silent and unable to rebuke them. Though they are a rebellious house, but when I speak to you, I will open your mouth and you, sh you shall say to, to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says, Whoever will listen, let him listen, and whoever refuse to let him uh, refuse, for they are a re rebellious house. So God is appointing Ezekiel as a watchman to warn people. The judgment is coming. So tell the people, if they listen to your message and turn away from the wickedness and then come to the Lord, great. But if you don't tell them, then it's your responsibility because they never heard the news and they never had a chance to turn around. If they heard the message and if they don't turn around and coming to the Lord and when the person dies, the person will die in his own sin. Now, we have listened to the message for all these years. Are you the watchman? Did God point you as a watchman? Yes? No? Every one of us is the watchman. Now, what do we do then? Well, we as a watchman's job is to know what's coming and warn the people. Whether they listen or don't listen. If they don't listen, it's their problem. But if they listen and turn away, turn away from wickedness and come to the Lord, it's great. There's no responsibility that we need to bring that person to the Lord. My responsibility is to tell the world. I don't have to be responsible whether that person will turn around and come, back, come to the Lord or not. It's not my responsibility. That's God's responsibility. It's a his prerogative, not mine. We don't try to save someone. It's not something I can't save that person. My responsibility is making sure that I speak the truth and what I learned from the Bible, warn them. That's my responsibility. But a lot of people shut their mouth. They listen to the message. It's good for them. That's it. The water does not flow. If the water does not flow, what happened? If the water stays in the one place for a long, long time, what happened? When you look at the map of Israel, okay? The water coming down from the Hermon Mountain, that's where the water is coming down. So water is coming down, and then what? The water gets into Galilee. And then after the Galilee, the water continues to flow down to the Jordan River. And the water continues to flow down to where? Where does that water flow down to? I think I've been shown the enough uh, the map. It's a Dead Sea. It's a Dead Sea. The water gets into the Dead Sea. And then what? It stays here. It's not going anywhere. It's dead. Water must flow. If the water does not flow, it's dead. 
Now, water came to me, and if I don't pass along, and if it does not flow through me, then what happened? The water that came to me is dead water now. It was a living water when it came to me, but it doesn't flow out of me, then it's dead. The living water that come to me, that it must flow out of me. It cannot stay here. That's why the living water always flow. God appointed us to be the watchman. Our job is to watch out, listen, and then tell the people, warn them what's coming. So what was the first thing that God did to Ezekiel? Take the scroll, eat of it. That was the first step. And then go and tell them. Whether they listen or not. Now, we all have to think about, am I the Dead Sea or am I the Jordan River? And Ezekiel chapter 33 says exactly the same thing. Ezekiel chapter 33. <clears throat> the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, speak to your countrymen and say to them, When I bring the sword against a land and the people of the land choose one of their men and make him their watchman. And he sees the sword coming against the land and the blows the trumpet to warn the people. Then if anyone hears the trumpet but does not take warning, and the sword comes and take his life, his blood will be on his own head. Since he heard the sound of trumpet and did not take warning, his blood will be on his own head. If he had taken warning, he would have saved himself. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet of war on the people, and the sword comes and takes the life of one of them, that man will be taken away because of his sins but I will hold the watchman accountable for his blood son of man I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel so hear the word I speak and give them warning from me when I say to the wicked O wicked man you will surely die and you do not speak out to uh, dissuade him from his way that wicked man will Die for his son, a sin, and I will hold you accountable for his blood. But if you do warn the wicked man to turn him his way, and he does not do so, he will die for his sins, but you will have saved yourself. <clears throat> son of man, say to the house of Israel, This is what you are saying. Our offenses and sins weighs, weighs us down, and we are wasting away because of them. <clears throat> How then? Can we live? Say to them, As surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their way and, and uh, live. Turn, turn your evil way. Why will you die, O house of Israel? So, once again, what is God's heart? Correct. God's heart is to save people. God wants to save even though you're wicked. God is not going to save because you're righteous. God wants to save the wicked man, but I point you as the watchman to tell and warn that people but if you're not doing your job because I made you to be the watchman and now you're responsible if he does die without hearing the warning once again 
we have to take this verse very seriously. How many times we have heard so many good words from the Lord? How many times He has touched our heart? How many times He actually let us know about this precious words and truth that He actually gave it to us? What do we do with that? I accept it, enjoy the words, be happy with the words, and glad. Now what? and shut our mouth. I'm happy. I don't know about other. Then we thought it was end here. No, it's not the end. Because you did not speak. Because you did not tell. Because you did not warn them. Now God is going to come after you. I thought it's not my responsibility. And God said, yes. It was your responsibility. I made you to be the appointment, appointed man. As I mentioned many times, as much as you guys are sitting in your room and having this conversation, I'm also sitting here in my room and speaking to you about the truth. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Because I am the watchman. Because I have to tell the world and I have to warn the people. Here's the word of God. Be watchful. Then you have to do the same thing. <coughs> Coming back to Leviticus chapter 5. If you near the unclean carcasses, whether you knew or not, doesn't matter. You'll become unclean. Verse 4. Or if person thoughtlessly take an oath to do anything, whether good or evil, in any matter what might carelessly swear about even though he is unaware of it in any case when he learns of it he will be guilty whoa 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 wait a second wait a second I have to be very careful because if I make an oath without even knowing that what I'm what I was doing and then I forgot about it. I didn't do anything about the oath that I made. I forgot. And we thought it was just done. No, it is not. You are guilty. When we were learning in Genesis... And when Jacob was running away from his brother Esau and he was just running to his uncle's place and then he made an oath God if you give me the food and protect me and give me clothes and then you actually bring me back to you know this place again you'll be my God and I will built an altar here and for 20 years he forgot what he prayed I would forget I don't remember what I prayed 20 years ago do you? well we forgot but that was all that we made maybe one day you know I was so touched in it and I prayed to the Lord Lord Make me a missionary. I didn't know anything about what missionary was. At the time, I was so touched, and then I was like, Oh my God, Lord, send me there. I didn't know what I was saying, but I said it. Well, now you're in trouble. <laughs> I forgot. I don't know what I did, what I prayed, 
But you know what? 20 years. Did God remember the Jacob's prayer? What he said? And he said all of a sudden, I am the God of Bethel. He never used that word before. And all of a sudden, and 20 years later, he just showed up. All of a sudden, out of blue, and he just showed up and said, I am the God of Bethel. When did you start calling yourself a God of Bethel again? Oh, 20 years ago. Because you prayed. God does not, rem does not forget. Not like us. He remembers. I forget, but he remembers. So he said, Go back to the land where you came from. Where did he go? Where did he go back to? God said, I am the God of Bethel. Go back. And where did he go? No, he did not go to Bethel. He went to somewhere else. He went to Shechem. He went to Shechem. And that's where his daughter got raped. Remember that place? And then he's two of his brother. Simeon and the Levi went to like you know tell them that if you actually uh, you know circumcise then I will give you our sister but when they circumcised the whole town and they just killed them all right remember that incident and God showed up again I'm a God of Bethel what are you doing here? Why are you in Shechem? And then, where did he go? Then he went up to Bethel. Jacob did not remember. Although God reminded him, I'm a God of Bethel. Go back to Bethel. But he went somewhere else. You know why? Because he forgot. God did not forget. So I tell you one thing. Be careful when you pray to the Lord. Especially when you make an oath to the Lord. Know what you're praying for. Don't say, whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, at that time, I didn't know what I was doing. Cancel this. It doesn't work. Be careful what you're praying for. <clears throat> Verse 5. When anyone is guilty in any of these uh, ways, he must confess in what way he has sinned and as a penalty for the sins he has committed, he must bring to the Lord a female lamb or a goat from the flock as a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement for him for his sin. All right. This verse 6, I want you to put an underline. This verse 6 is important. We're going to read one more time. And as a penalty for the sin he has a command, a committed, he must bring to the Lord a female lamb or a goat from the flock as a sin offering. And the priest shall make atonement for him for his sins. In verse 5, what did he say? When anyone is guilt in any of these ways he must confess in what way he has a sinned. All right, think about this for a moment. This particular word is 
important to understand. So, anyone's a guilty in any of this way, he must confess, right? He must confess in what way he has sinned. What if you don't confess? What if you don't confess? You're still guilty. If you don't confess, you're still guilty. So you have to confess. Right? So, we have to remember when we feel guilty, not just to feel guilty, but if we committed something, then we have to confess. Is a confession important? It is important. So we'll say, mm, well, well, I think I did wrong, but if I don't confess anything, then it's a problem, right? Okay, so let's take a look at First John. Verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is a faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. What do you say? If we confess our sins. What if you don't confess? Right. Once again, th there, there is a reason why I say this is important. Because the sin offering and the guilt offering, it's a little confusing. But, that in, but in order for us to understand the relationship between the sin offering and the guilt offering, this is why I put almost the whole time talking about sin last week. Because if you don't understand sin... And if you don't understand the relationship between sin offering and a guilt offering, it's, it's very confusing. So, now I'm going to ask you this. It's, you know, as always, if I don't ask any question, it's not key. So, I have to ask some questions. All right. What is sin and what is guilt? What's the difference between sin and guilt? <laughs> well, feelings. Any other way? Is 
because you know, it's funny that we think we we know what sin and what guilt is and when but when someone asks like this way like tell me the difference between sin and guilt and like well <laughs> well <laughs> Okay, so let's think about it for a moment. One day, you're outside. You're playing, you know, um, you're throwing bowls at each other, right? You, you've, uh, you have the gloves and you're throwing bowls and the other person catches bowl and then you just throw it again back and forth back and forth and then you threw it the person misses it and then bowl just fly by and then run through the someone else's house window and then shatters the window is that a sin or is that a guilt <laughs> yeah, it's both it is a sin and guilt okay so I'll give, let me give you a different example you're driving and you're driving on the highway and then you just say like, I gotta run to like the place that you just step on the gas shoo, and then soon enough you'll see like the lights bing 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 and then you pulled off and uh, the officer walks over knock 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 yes officer do you know how fast you're going? Uh, well, I was, uh, yeah, I think I was running at uh, 70 miles. You know where the, uh, what the speed zone is? Here it is. Well, it says a 50. All right. Did you, did you sin? Or is it a, is it a sin or is it a guilt? <laughs> it is both.
go to court, you pleaded sin or you pleaded guilt? Why not sin? So is that a sin or is that a guilty? So is that a sin or guilt? then this is the part where most people get confused sin versus a guilt <laughs> what is a sin and what is a guilt and how does God see sin versus a guilt so if you broke the window someone else's window what do you do You apologize. You apologize. I'm so sorry, sir. I, I broke the window. And then what? Well, you pay them to fix the window. Okay? When you speed, you got a ticket, what do you do? You pay you pay the speeding ticket fine, right? Now, when you committed something, right? The guilt is something you paid for. It's not sin. The law doesn't say you have a sin. You have guilt not sin breaking with someone else's window is not sin it's a guilt when you speed it's a guilt not sin when you commit sin you go to jail when you plead guilt you don't go to jail you pay the fine you you pay for the window the guilt comes with the penalty which you have to pay for. Sin, you don't pay. You just go to you go to jail. Do you understand? You kill someone. You don't pay that person. Do they pay and then go to jail? Or they just go to jail? You go to jail. The guilt and sin, it's, a, it's, it's like similar to each other, but they're different. So then, question is, if the sin and guilt is a very similar to each other, which one is bigger? Sin is bigger, guilt is bigger. Or the same. Yeah, which one's bigger? Sin is bigger, or the guilt is bigger, or are they the same? Are they equally are they equally the same? Or one is bigger than the other?
When I started to talk about sin and guilt, right, I mentioned the verse that we're reading, verse 5 and 6 is important, I said. So the whole conversations came out of this verse 5 and 6. So let's focus on what it says. Let's read one more time. When anyone is guilty in any of these ways, he must confess in what way he has sinned. And as a penalty for the sin he has committed, he must bring to the Lord a female lamb or a goat from flock as a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement for him for his sins. Wait a second. He start off as what? He start off as a guilt, but you give what? Wait a second, there is a separate guilt offering and sin offering, isn't it? So if you guilt, then what should you, what should you do? You're supposed to give a guilt offering, not sin offering, right? But if anyone is guilt, why are you giving sin offering? Aren't they supposed to be different? Well, you didn't catch this one as I was reading multiple times. So, you can, you, you have a guilt but you gave the sin offering. If that's the case, then guilt is a bigger than sin. So think of it this way. Um, let's assume that you have, I don't know, maybe I should just draw this one, that's maybe easier. Uh, Okay, let me see if I can show this. All right, so this circle is a sin. So this, the circle, the whole thing is a sin. And there is guilt. Oh, wait a second. No, I reversed it, sorry. how teachers unprepare. All right, once again, let me try it again. So this is guilt and this is sin and guilt and sin overlaps. They're very similar to each other. But there are, are area, the sins that are not overlapping with guilt. The guilt covers good portion of a sin. So within a guilt, the sin is a portions of a guilt. But there are area where is like 
not overlapping with guilt. Okay? What I mean by that is, when we're learning about the sin offering, there are four different sin offerings. Do you remember what offering? What are the offering? No, no, no. Within sin offering, there are four different sin offering. What? Right, there is a the sin offering for the priest. Right? If the priest have a sin and there is sin offering for the priest and second offering was when the whole Israelite community have sinned they give a sin offering for the whole community and the third sin offering was if a leader have a sin then you give a sin offering right and the if any member of the community have a sin, then you give offering to the uh, the sin offering for that member of the community. So there are four different types of a sin offering. Within this, are four different types of a sin offering. Remember, there are area that are overlapping with each other, but there are area where it doesn't overlap each other. Right. So there is a specific sin offering that are just sorely dedicated to God. That is, when, when the priests have a sin, when the whole Israelites a community have a sin, that does not overlap with guilt offering. But the leaders or the member of the community have a sin that overlaps with guilt offering. So you could give sin offering even though you have guilt, which is the portions that I just mentioned that it's overlapping with each other. When a leader have a sin or the member of the community have sinned, then you can give, if anyone is guilt, you can give sin offering because that's overlapping each other. Do you understand? So, continue on. If he cannot afford a lamb, he is, to, he is to bring two doves or two young pigeons to the Lord as a penalty for his sin. One for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. He is to bring them to the priest who shall first offer the one for the sin offering, he is to uh, writing its uh, head from its neck, a uh, wiring. He is, he is to wa wiring its head from its neck, not serving it completely, and is to sprinkle some of the blood of the sin offering against the side of the altar. The rest of the blood must be drained out at the base of the altar. It is a sin offering. The priest shall then offer the other as a burnt offering in the prescribed way and it make atonement for him for the sin he has committed and he will be get forgiven if however he cannot afford two doves or two pigeons he is to bring as an offering for his sin a tenth of an epa a fine flour for a sin offering he must not put oil or incense on it because it is a sin offering he is to bring it to the priest. He shall take a handful of it as a memorial portions and burn it on the altar on top of the offering made to the Lord by fire. It is a sin offering. In this way, the priest will make atonement for him for any of these sins he has committed, and he will be forgiven. The rest of the offering will belong to the priest, as in case of the grain offering. So when you give the sin offering for the priest or when you give the sin offering for the entire 
Israel community, you must have burned them all. You cannot take any food from there. It only dedicated to God and it, everything has to be burned. There's no part that man t- can take it. But if the leader has sinned, or if the member of the community have sinned, portions of the, f- of the food is dedicated to the priest so that he can eat. Or if you bring the flour, you have to do the same thing. So, it starts from what? It started off from like lamb or goat. Or if you don't, you can't afford to bring lamb or goat, you can bring doves or pigeons. Or if you can't afford it, you can bring the flour. Now, I want you to think about it. I want you to think about God's heart. God wants to forgive regardless of your financial condition. It's not, it's not what you bring. Just because you bring lamb or goat, I forgive you more. You're so poor that you brought this like pigeons or dove or, or flour. Well, I will forgive you just a little. No. Whether you bring a lamb or a goat versus a flower does not matter. But you have to bring it. Why? Because you have committed sins. So you have to pay for something. But even though it is just a little, I want you to bring it and pay it so that I can forgive you. So what is God's heart? Is God's heart for you to bring some nice, you know, offering to the Lord? Or God's heart is to just to forgive your sin? Which one is it? God wants to forgive you. Doesn't matter. Even though very little, that's okay. My heart, it just wants to forgive you. Yesterday, my daughter was pulling my wife's car out of the garage and hit the door. And then the driver's side, the front fender, and the bumper got damaged severely. This is third time she had an accident. Well, it's going to cost me some money here to fix it. So what do I do? Well, should I get mad or should I not get mad or what should I do? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I want you to since you're none of you are parents. I want you to think about what your mother would have had done.
who pays for the fix. Yes, the parent pays, right? I said to her yesterday, I just looked at her and said, Appado Hindrida. That was it. <laughs> There's nothing more to say. Damage was done. We have to fix it. There's no reason to get like angry. But eventually, I have to pay. And I've been paying. Eventually, when you get married and when you have a child, and you would do the same thing. Right? <coughs> so, from God's perspective, God's heart is not about what you bring. What you bring is truly meaningless to God. Burning animal, burning flower, what does that matter to God? Does it, any, does it add, add any value to God? No, it doesn't. It's not for God. It's for me. It's for the sinner. Right? But God's heart is, without paying it, I can't forgive you. But it's okay. It doesn't have to be a big thing. I don't want you to have a, a lot of money to be forgiven. I forgive you. Just to bring something, because you have to pay, because I'm a righteous God. But I'll forgive you. We're not forgaved because we're righteous, because we have done some right, not because I'm better than other people. It's got nothing to do with it. God pay for it. It's not me pay for it. You have to understand the sin offering is the important part of the, all the offering for, for a man. This is why he spends so much rules on sin offering. This is the longest of all the offerings that you see. And there's a lot of questions. So where do you draw the line between the sin offering versus guilt offering? Where does the sin offering start to end and where does the guilt offering start to end? There is a controversy or you know, uh, conversation. But some people consider entire chapter 5 is a guilt offering. Some people say, well, big portions of chapter 5 is a continuation of the sin offering. It's not a guilt offering. But when you actually read it carefully, he talks about guilt as well. He talks about sin as well. This is where we get confused. Is that a sin offering or is that a guilt offering? Which one is it? Is it a guilt or a sin? This is where most people get confused. But as I mentioned, they're like so close to each other. They're overlapping each other. So it's like this. Human have two legs. Right? Human have two legs. So then can we say anything that has two legs are is a human? Right? So human has two legs, but anything has a two leg is a human is a two different thing. You can't say that because there are a lot of other stuff that has a two legs. Right? 
besides man. But men have two legs is a right statement. But two legs are not all man. With that example, it's like the second statement is like guilt. The human is a part of um, the creations that have two legs. But there are other parts of a creations that have two legs. Correct? So you can think of it as a second statement is a guilt and the first statement is a sin. It's not a perfect example, but it's just kind of illustrations of it. <clears throat> now, going back to verse 11 again. If, however, cannot afford two doves or two young pigeons that he used to bring as an offering for his sin, a tenth of an epa of a fine flour for a sin offering, he must not put oil or incense on it because it is a sin offering. Draw that line. What did you say? All right. He must not put oil or incense on it because it is a sin offering. If you actually bring a flower, which is a grain offering, when you give grain offering, you must put oil and you must put incense. That was the law that we learned from grain offering. Remember? But you're bringing grain, the flower, but you can't put oil or incense because this is not a grain offering although you bring flour it is not a grain offering it is a sin offering and you cannot put oil or incense why why Because this is a sin offering, it's not a offering that is general or it is for sharing or for gladness, it is for pain, it is for our sin. When you actually pay for the sin, is it a happy moment? Whether the person who pays or a person who receives, is it a happy moment? Wow, it got the like money. No. For either party, the person who gives or person who receives is not the is not the happy moment. This is the moment where we moan. It's a painful moment. That's why there's no oil. That's why there's no incense. You cannot put anything there. Verse 14. The Lord said to Moses, When a person commits a violation and sin unintentionally in regard to any of the Lord's holy things, he is to bring to the Lord as a penalty a ram for, from the flock, one without defect of a proper value in silver. According to the sanctuary shekel, it is a guilt offering. He must make restitution for what he has failed to do in regard to the holy things, add a fifth of the value to and a value that and give it all to the priest who will make atonement for him with the ram as a guilt offering, and he will be forgiven. If a person sins 
And does what is forbidden in any of the Lord's commands, even though he does not know it, he has a guilt and will be held responsible. He is to bring to the priest as a guilt offering a ram from the flock, one without defect of the proper value. In this way, the priest will make atonement for him for the wrong he has committed unintentionally, and he will be forgiven. It is a guilt offering. He has been guilt of wrongdoing against the Lord. So the sin offering versus guilt offering. Think of it this way. Right before Jesus actually crucified, Jesus was performing the the washing feet ceremony to his disciples. And when he was about to wash the Peter's feet, and the Peter said, Whoa, 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 whoa. Don't don't do this to me, Lord. You're not supposed to do this. And what was the answer of Jesus? Right. If I don't actually do this, then you and I have no relationship. Right? So then, what did Peter say? Well, let's actually, let's actually go to that place. It's uh, John chapter 13, right? John chapter 13. It was just before the Passover feast, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father, having loved his own, who were in the world, he now showed him the full ex extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simeon, to betray the Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal and took off his outer clothing and wrapped a cloth uh, wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet and my hands and my heads as well. Jesus answered, A person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean, and you are clean through not every one of you. For he knew he was going to betray him, and that was why he said not every one of uh, one was clean so jesus was saying if i don't wash your feet you have no part with me and he said if anyone who already take bath you don't need to continue to take bath but you need to wash your hands and feet so the difference between guilt and sin. Sin offering is like we're taking bath. Everything is washed away. After we believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior, we confess with our lips and believe it in our heart that we confess that Jesus Christ is my Savior and I'm a sinner and He cleansed my sins. We're taking Beth, our original sins, 
and all the sins that we had, whether we remember or not, it will be all washed away. After we accepted the Jesus Christ and our sins are forgiven, do we continue to sin? We continue to sin with our body, with our soul. Of course, our spirit does not sin, but we continue to sin as long as we live in this world. Right? So that happened after we believe in Jesus Christ. Then what? We have to confess our sins so that our sins can be forgiven. So the sins that we continue to sin after we believe in Jesus Christ, although our sins have been forgiven, washed away when we believed in Jesus Christ, it's like we're take, we took Beth, our sins washed away, but we get filthy again, so we have to confess with our lips so that our sins can be forgiven. So, guilt offering is like the sins that we continue to commit even after we believe in Jesus Christ. So, Jesus Christ has died as sin offering to wash our sins for all of us. Right? And He became a guilt offering continue to forgive us when we confess. So when you read Isaiah chapter 53 Isaiah chapter 53 we're going to read from verse 10 and on yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer and though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering he will see his offering and prolong his days and they will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. What offering? Guilt offering. He gave himself up as a guilt offering as well, not just sin offering. So when you look at <coughs> Hebrews <coughs> chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 9, reading from verse 11. When Christ came as a high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, that is to say, not a part of the creations. He did not enter by mean of the blood of, of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemptions, the blood of goat and bulls and of uh, bulls and the ashes of the heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially clean uh, unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself as unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God. Jesus gave himself as not only guilt offering, but he gave himself up as what? Sin offering. When he offered himself as a sin offering, that means he offered himself as a sin offering to cleanse all of our sins, once for all. 
but for the sins that we continue to sin, commit, that through the guilt offering, that He actually continues to forgive us. That's why we learned about that God put Jesus Christ as a sin. Remember what sin offering is? Uh, is uh, the sin offering is hatat, right? So you give hatat for the hatat. And guilt offering is asham. You give guilt, which is asham, You give Asham. You give guilt offering for your guilt. It makes sense. But if you give guilt offering for guilt, it makes no sense in English or any other language. But a Hebrew word, you give Asham for Asham. You give guilt for the guilt is what he means. And like hatat, you give hatat for hatat, you give asham for asham. It's the same word. So, for the sins that we committed after we believe in Jesus Christ, we have to confess so that God could forgive us. And then, another important thing that we have to remember is, when you go to uh, Leviticus chapter nine, uh, chapter seven, verse one, these are the regulation for the guilt offering, which is most holy. What? The guilt offering is what? The most holy. We're learning about all the offerings right now, starting from burnt offering to grain offering, peace offering, and uh, sin offering, and guilt offering. This is the last one. But as we're learning all this offering, there's no mention of any particular offering is like this. But guilt offering, which is most holy. Most holy means holy of holy, which means it is the tabernacle or holy of holy it means the guilt offering is holy of holy why because this guilt offering which covers the majority of the, all the sins is the most holy things that God ever did for us for our sins to be completely washed away so that we don't continue to even though we continue to sin that our sins can be completely washed but as, once again our flesh our soul continue to sin but our spirit cannot sin that's why when we go to heaven at the end do we sin in heaven? No, we don't. We can't. Anyone who has the Jesus is in us. No one can sin. So that's why I said we sin, but we don't sin. But that you have to understand what the difference is. So, Remember, guilt offering 
you have to pay for the guilt. So when we go to, if you go to Exodus chapter 22, which we have learned, we learned something here. Exodus chapter 22. If a man steals an ox or sheep and slaughters it or sells it, he must pay pay back five head of cattle for for the ox and the four sheep for the sheep. So if anyone has steal ox or sheep, you have to actually pay for it. And how many times do you have to pay? Five times. If you actually committed, uh, if you gave um, the sheep, you actually paid four times. So then, let's think about it for a moment. You stolen this ox or sheep. You don't give them back one for one. You give either five times more or four times more. So that means your paying amount is higher than what you did. Right? You pay more than what you have stolen. Right? So then, if I have a sin, then I don't have to pay for just for what, what I have a sin. But what I have to pay is more than what I have done. Right? Correct? If I have to pay five times more, well, that's a lot. If I actually hit someone, right, and then damage the car, and the cost of the fixing the car is maybe like two grand, but if I have to pay for five times more, well, that will be a really a big thing, right? Well, then think about it. If I'm a sinner, then I have to pay for my sins. But if God is asking for you have to pay for five times more than what you have a sin. Well, I can't afford to pay. I can't. So then, Jesus paid my debt. Right? He died for my sins. Not just for my sins. But five times more that I supposed to pay back. But God paid that for me. It's not me who paid, it's Jesus who paid. Remember the king who actually forgave the debt the person had? And then he went out and he just grabbed someone who actually borrowed the money from him and said, He actually, I'm. If you don't pay my money, or I'm going to put you in jail. And then when the king heard of it, bring that servant back. Right? The reason that the servant was forgiven is because he could afford a payback, but because he couldn't afford to pay. It doesn't matter how many years he has worked, how much money he uh, he had, he won't be able to pay back this money that he owed to his master. And just master cleanses debt. Our sins, not to mention about my own sins, and if I have to pay for five more times, I can't afford to pay back. But who paid it for me? Jesus did. Who paid it for you? Jesus did. Jesus did. Five times more. Okay.
Any questions up to this point? Five and six was talking about with your guilt, you give sin offering, which means out of a four sin offering, right? The sin of a priest, sin of entire Israelites, and sin of a leader, and sin of a member of a community. So this guilt offering that you give it as a sin offering, reference those two latter part of the sin offering, which is the sin offering that you give for the leader as well as for the the member of the community but you cannot give the sin the guilt offering as a sin offering when this is the priest the sin offering or the entire community is of uh, the sin offering that's what i was actually explaining to you about So that's why I was asking which one's bigger. The guilt is bigger than sin. Is that what you were going to ask? Well, that killing animal was what? Was it literally means eventually the Jesus Christ will die as a sacrificed lamb. Because our sins could never be cleansed with the, the killing of an animal or the blood of the animal. It's the most precious. Yeah, right. It's not something we can pay for. It's just too much we can't afford. So now you understand all different types of uh, offerings and what it means and why we have to understand all this offering. Although we don't actually you know, kill the animals and we're not the one who's going to actually give this animal to the priest. What is the meaning of this entire offering? What does it mean? God was ex explaining to Israelites, this is what eventually will happen. That Jesus will come and he will give the, all this offering, the burnt offering, grain offering, peace offering, sin offering, and guilt offering. He's the ultimate sacrifice lamb will be actually given to God to cleanse your sins. I want you to remember this every year when you do this. But later on, they completely forget why God gave us this offering. They just kept killing animals. They were just keep burning the animals. But what's the purpose of doing all this? But God wanted to show us that all this offering is literally means the death of Jesus Christ to pay for our sins. That's why the sin offerings and guilt offerings and all the rest of the offerings that we have learned, you have to know this. This is what Jesus has done. Without knowing it, then you, it don't mean anything. Jesus Christ died on a cross? Okay, so what? For what? Without this, you don't understand. This is why the, we have to understand the, all the soul frame. Any other questions? 